everyone. Can you hear me okay? Hello. Can everyone hear me now? I'm going to have to really shout, aren't I? I'm sorry. It's too exciting. Hello. Right. Sorry, just bear with us while the last person is getting their glass of wine or their beer. Oh, that got everyone's attention. I should talk about alcohol, shouldn't I? <laughs> Barry, keep it down. Okay. Um, sorry to anyone on Zoom if you just had to listen to that. Um, hopefully very amusing or not too annoying. Um, it is really lovely to see you all here today. And before I carry on with my intro waffle as I like to discuss it, can we just check that everyone on Zoom can hear me okay? Could someone pop in the chat? Oh, okay. Oh. Can Zoom hear me first? Is that... Can the Zoom people hear, Steve? Yep. Can everyone hear me now? Is that better? Great, thank you. And I will stop trying to talk as quickly as well, which I know I am very good at doing. So hello properly, I am Becky, and most of you probably know me as the events curator at the St. Bride Foundation. And it's just really lovely have, to have you all here today to celebrate the printing museums of Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland. Um, if you didn't know, all the ticket, ticket proceeds from this talk go to help keeping our fantastic library and print workshop running for future generations and current generations to enjoy. So just by being here, you're supporting us in a really big way and it is hugely appreciated. Um, what else have I got to say? Sorry, I'm getting my brain in gear. Um, so if we have any technical issues for the people on Zoom, I just want to let you know that we are recording the lecture. So if anyone is having issues there and or if our live stream cuts out for any reason, Please don't worry, this will be recorded and you'll get the recording after the event in the next couple of days. And that goes for the people in the audience as well. So if you booked a ticket, you'll be able to watch this back if you would like to. Um, if people are having problems with Zoom on the Zoom call, um, obviously not for the people in-house, um, sometimes just logging in and out of Zoom does sort it out. So just call the IT crowd, turn it off and on again. Hopefully that will be sorted. So if you are having any issues. For in-person in -person people, please can you just make sure your mobiles are turned on silent? We don't mind photographs, but please just make sure you don't use a flash because it's really um, distracting for the speakers. Um, and for anyone else in person, if there is a fire, which hopefully won't happen, the fire alarm is one continuous bell and the meeting place is just through reception and in the courtyard out there. If the fire happens to be in reception, we will direct you down the stairs, past the print workshop, past the bar, you can't stop off for a drink, it's an emergency, and we'll guide you up round to the meeting point. So hopefully you're prepared in the case of any eventuality. And I would just like to let you know about some fantastic things we've got coming up at St. Bride over the next couple of months. At the moment, our fantastic um, volunteer, Keith Adams, has curated an absolutely stunning exhibition of decorated papers, which is downstairs in our um, exhibition room. And the exhibition is open on until, I think, the 24th of June, is that correct? Um, so do phone ahead, because sometimes I think the room is booked, but I think generally it's open every day, nine till five-ish. So do come along. I think Keith will be there most days to talk about it. Oh, no, not he's not. Keith will be there on Saturday to talk about it. it he's an absolute treasure trove of knowledge, and it's just going to be well worth a visit. It's very small, but perfectly formed and full of absolute riches. So do come along and look at that if you happen to be nearby, or make a special trip to come in. Come on, do that as well. Um, our next talk, which is, I think, the last one of the season before we break for the summer, is an iMagazine Type Tuesday event, which is a book design special and it's being held with Nico Taylor and Jack Smith, and it's definitely not one to miss. And you can book for that on our website. At this point, I usually talk a lot about our print workshop and library and what you can do with them. But as this talk is about the library, I'm going to spare you, and then Alicia and Steve will be able to give you lots more information. Um, the talk tonight will be approximately 70 to 90 minutes, sort of depends how long things go on. We may have a break halfway through for about 10 minutes, but we'll see how it's going and how the time's going. So I just wanted to let you know that. And tonight we are really delighted to be joined by Alicia Chilcott, who is the archivist at St. Bride Foundation, and Steve Linen, who is from the St. Bride Print Imperial Chapel of the Print Workshop here. We're being joined by Sue Morris from the Cambridge Museum of Technology. Paul Nash from Norwich Printing Museum, 
Richard Lawrence from the Bodleian Bibliographical Press in Oxford and Mary Plunkett from the National Print Museum in Dublin. And of course, there are way more printing institutions in the UK which are not being talked about tonight. Um, and of course, we would love more people to be here, but you know, it's only so long we can talk in one evening about printing. Well, actually, I know people who could talk all night, so you know, we've got to cap it to an hour and a half-ish. So, of course, we have put a list of those people on our website if you'd like to know more, um, because you know we want to make sure everyone is included. And if we've missed anyone out, please let us know, because we're always looking to make new connections and things. So hopefully everyone is covered, and we also hope you have a fantastic evening this evening. And I'd finally like to say a huge thank you to Google and the Wink and the Word Charitable Trust for sponsoring our lectures. Without them, we couldn't do things like the live streaming and give students tickets to come along to talk. So we're really grateful to them as well. And I think that is it from me. So I'm now very delighted to introduce our first speaker, who is Alicia Chilcott, and she is not a relative of mine, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> um, so I will hand over to Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi, um, I'm Alicia, and as Becky said, I'm our archivist here. Um, so I should say that I am not a printer, um, I'll admit that. Um, I came here a few years ago as our archivist, and I've been kind of swatting up on the print side of things since then, with lots of help from our workshop team and from the excellent resource that is Bob Richardson in our library. Um, so, myself and Steve are going to talk um, a bit about our library and workshop here and how the two kind of work together. I'll start with a quite whistle-stop history of the foundation and how our collections came to be. Um, so, the foundation was established in 1891 with the aim of providing social, cultural and educational amenities for the people of Fleet Street and Farringdon. And that area, of course, had very strong ties with the um, print trade at the time. Um, so our building originally housed a printing school to train people who were working on Fleet Street. And it was furnished with all of the kind of latest printing equipment, including a cutting edge linotype machine. Uh, classes in the printing school constantly were evolving to meet all the technical developments of the trade. By 1922, the school had outgrown our building here and it relocated to become what was London College of Printing, which today has become London College of Communication, which is based over in Elephant and Castle. And these pictures show um, some of the printing school that was here at the time. Um, alongside the printing school, we also provided facilities such as the City of London's first heated swimming pool a gym, lending library, wash house and laundry. And we were a real kind of hive of activity with lots of sports and arts clubs, lectures and all kinds of cultural events going on. Uh, so this photo shows our um, Passmore Edwards reading room. Uh, this was from around 1900. Um, and it still looks pretty similar to that today, albeit with a few less moustaches and bowler hats in the room. Um, after the departure of the printing school in the 1920s, the technical library that had served the printing school, um, it stayed here in St. Bride Foundation. The collection has been added to quite a bit over the years, so it now includes not just your kind of technical manuals and type specimens and examples of printed material, but also um, printing and type founding equipment and lots of archive collections. Um, so you can see some images of a bit of the range of our collections here. Um, so the library is used today by a global audience of printers, designers, students and academics, and all kinds of creatives. Uh, the collection comprises over 80,000 items, including over 250 archives, and we think the world's largest collection of type specimens, or at least no one has told us off for saying that yet. Uh, the type specimens are really the kind of jewel in our crown. Uh, they date from 1616 to the present day and take up over 145 linear meters of shelving, which I measured earlier. Um, they are the most well-used area of the collections with regular use by designers looking for inspiration for their next type revival and students studying historical developments in type. 
so during our recent 125th anniversary year, we were grateful to receive over £65,000 via our anniversary crowdfunding campaign. Uh, so thank you to any of you who contributed to that. Uh, that enabled us to digitize our earliest type specimens from the collection, which can now be viewed for free online on the Internet Archive, and I've included a little URL there. Uh, the screenshot you can see here shows a spread from the earliest type specimen in our collection. And it's really great that we can now share all of these really rare items with our global online audience without having to kind of handle the original fragile items so much. Um, since 2020, we've embarked on a cataloging program focusing on our archive collections because much of that had not been fully catalogued before. Uh, this process is helping us both to make the collections more easily discoverable for researchers via our online catalogue, um, but it also helps us to understand our collections better in more detail. The archive side of our collections includes a lot of real gems, and we're quite excited to see them hopefully used a bit more. Um, some of the collections that we've catalogued so far include the personal papers of Beatrice Ward, a collection of blocks and proof volumes from the Chiswick Press, material by the typographic panel for the Festival of Britain, um, and some proof sketches and stencils from Edward Johnston's work for London Transport. Uh, we're also making a start on one of our biggest and to us most important collections, which is the St. Bride Foundation archive itself. Most recently, we've been pulling together our type collections and creating a dedicated type store. Part of this project has been to create boxed study collections containing one of each character of every font um, that will make our type more accessible to researchers in the reading room. Once our lovely new organized type store is complete, we'll also be cataloging all of those in detail. And we're very thankful to the stationers company who have agreed to provide some funds towards that project. So these collections are a really fantastic research resource, but they only really come to life through engagement with our amazing community of researchers, printers, designers, and of course our volunteers, and all of the people who come to our talks, who visit our exhibitions or book onto workshops. It's the storytelling about working in the heyday of Fleet Street's print trade, the swapping of historical fun facts across the reading room desk, and all the chats in the bell after talks that really add color to our printing heritage that we are preserving here. Print heritage is a field with such rich material culture and social history that is crucial to preserve not only the written record, but also the objects of print and the intangible side as well. The tactile experience of operating a press or the judder of the Heidelberg through the building. Since print has largely disappeared from Fleet Street, our location here in our original building becomes especially important as a final vestige of that local heritage. Walking around our building, you can imagine what it would have felt like to train in, at the printing school in these walls. Our building and our community are as much a part of the collection as the books, the archives, and our presses. And whilst the traditional view of a library conjures ideas of silence and shushing, we try to encourage more creativity and hands-on engagement with our collections. We love when our reading room is noisy with conversation and we want people to learn about print in a hands-on way. This is where our library and print workshop existing in conversation with one another really comes into its own. It allows people to learn about print history both academically through studying the collections and practically through getting their hands inky in the workshop. And at that point, I will hand over to Steve who can tell everyone more about the workshop side of things. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Linen and I'm one of the workshop chapel. I've got my notes because 10 years ago I would have memorized all this, but as I've got older, I have to refer to them as I go. The workshop, I've got to start from the beginning. The workshop is all volunteers and we're in at the workshop two or three days a week. What the workshop isn't, a museum. 
The workshop is a museum, got museum pieces, but it's really there for use. We want people to come in, learn about printing, understand printing, enjoy it, and go away with a positive experience. The type and presses in our workshop are for using, not to just be walked past and looked at and talked about, but for people to get on them and actually print things and go away with something that they've printed. That said, I'm going to now tell you about what actually does go on in the workshop uh, all the time. First of all, we run Adana courses. And the Adana courses are one-day courses every fortnight, twice a month. People come on the course, we show them how to set type properly, as we would when we were apprentices. We treat the whole day as if it was our first day as an apprentice starting work. We tell them how to hold the stick, how to use the stick, how to sort type, how to spot it, set it in the stick and justify it to a full out measure. They spend the morning setting the type, full stick full, and then at the end of the morning they print it, take a proof and read it. That's when we hear the, the famous lines that we quoted ourselves. Oh dear, the B is upside down. Oh no, I've spelt that wrong. What? We all did that when we were apprentices and they do that on their first day as well. We get them to correct it and then that's the end of the first morning. In the afternoon, the idea then is to print all of that on the Adanas. So the afternoon is spent on the stone imposing their type that they've set ready for putting on the presses. They put them on the presses and print them out. We're there to help and assist and we have to, and we get it wrong sometimes and don't get a good result, but we get it right eventually. They print them all along, we set everything up for them, and then they get a certificate at the end, providing they've done it right, and they usually do, we make sure they do, but they get a certificate of completion. Bear with. Also, once in the summer, every summer, we run a three-day summer school where students, attendees, come along and spend three days. They've designed their own posters and they set, use the wooden type that we've got in the stores, set their own poster and print it on the iron presses. We've got a Colombian, an Albion and a Stanhope and they all jump on, they all print their own one whatever they've decided to do, as many colours as they want to do. And there's some of the posters they get done. There are the posters drawing. Another thing we offer is public tours. And we've had a public tour today. 18 people turned up. They come in, they get a two hour, a two hour public tour. The one hour is spent in the workshop, in the um, library where they get to see some of the historical things that Alicia has mentioned. In this case they're looking at uh, the Book of the Dead, you can't see his face but that's Bob Richardson, Book of the Dead from 1300 BC or the Caxton from 1598 and lots of other things. The second hour is with us in the workshop. We lay out lots of tools, lots of implements. We try and take them through from hand moulds through to the mechanical typesetting systems, explaining how they worked, how it progressed from 1450 up until mid-1980s when pretty much most of the letterpress stuff stopped. We tell them lots of stories. They always ask anecdotes. We have to tell them what we've done for a living, how we lived and worked in the printing industry and they all seem to enjoy the tours. Another thing that happens in the workshop is we run wood engraving courses. They're run by our resident wood engraver, Peter Smith, and he takes the students through all aspects of wood engraving, right through to printing and making a final edition. We also have our waste goose. We had one on Sunday. 30 stalls or more selling all sorts of print-related subjects, material, paper, type, everything. Down in the workshop, they come down there as well. We sell other bits and pieces, Chiswick blocks, uh, printing plates, anything that 
we can sell, they want to buy, and there's quite a demand for it. But at the same time, while we're selling stuff, people that aren't printers come in as well. It's really packed in there. We take them through, talk about printing. We've got lots of jobs on the presses, so they can all pull a proof, take a proof away, or 10. Lots of them go away with plenty of proofs. And that's us, still doing that. But in amongst all the tours, the talks, the, the courses, we still have to do our own work. And some of our projects, printing projects, that we, we've got quite a few on the go. But one of them was we was given a royal proclamation from 1952 that weighs a tonne and is about four foot by three foot, donated by TSO, Stationery Office's Parliamentary Press, and donated to us by the National Archives. Huge type form. We couldn't get it on any presses, so we printed it by hand. That's not me, because I'm not bald and I'm not old. So that's somebody <laughs> else. <laughs> what happened to me? I don't know. So we were thinking, this, this is an unfair picture, because out of the shot are the other lads in the chapel that were, were doing it as well. But because I'm doing the talk, you're getting a picture of me. So it was inked by hand, the paper was laid on the bench on the type, and with our fingertips, we just were running our fingertips along each one till we got a reasonable print off of it. We had a limited edition run of 25, and we've sold all of those now. But the most important thing, and I would say this downstairs in the workshop, is us, the chapel. All of the journeymen have done their six-year apprenticeships in the trade, been here, done it, got the T-shirt. Between us, we've got an experience of 250 years of experience. From uh, machine minders, compositors, stone hands, monotype operators, linotype operators. And I'm going to tell you a bit about the chapel. We all started when we were 15 years old and finished when we were 21. I think I turned up to work, I'm not sure if I turned up to work in shorts when I was 15, but I wasn't far short of that. You did your six year apprenticeship, you, you learned everything your trade, your company could tell you as a trade, then you got sacked. Mostly you got sacked and you had to move around the trade as a journeyman, which that's when you learn more about printing and other types of printing. But also at this point, I want to, want to say that everyone that comes here always asks about newspapers. How do you print newspapers? What did you do? But newspapers are a big part of the printing industry, but certainly not the biggest part. The biggest part of the printing industry are thousands of little jobbing printers, big companies, book producers. So Fleet Street is here, and we're in Fleet Street, but it's not the main part of print. Printing was a huge operation. So we're still going strong. How am I doing for time? Okay. I'm OK. We're still going strong, but we also have a culture in print. If you've worked in print, it's got its own culture, it's got its own traditions, it's got its own tricky jokes that you play on each other, all sorts of things going on. That, that we don't just get people up in the courses and say, do this, do that. They ask hundreds of questions, what was you doing, what was printing like? So we've given the anecdotes, the stories, all of the background of what being a printer really was, and they all, they all love that conversation. But that's because we've done it. We have lots of words and phrases that we use that mean something for us, and gobble is one of my favourites. Couldn't live without gobble because it paid a lot of money. But I won't tell you what they all mean because if you want to know, you've got to buy the post up or our little glossary of printing trades. <laughs> now, last thing, are we old? I had to write this down because I don't believe it myself. The chapel, are we old? Only in body. The forms of type get heavier as we get older? They bloody do. Can we drink as much as we did when we were younger? Uh-uh. Are we past it? Not on your Nelly. Come to St Bride, come to the workshop, see what print is all about. Feel the atmosphere, hear the conversations, 
have some abuse given to you, give some back, and that's us. Is that okay? Thank you. And Steve forgot his end slide, the early cut, so. Oh, yeah, beg your pardon. Should have said, as I got to that slide, I watched my overseer, my FOC, winked at me, which meant I can have an early cut. And that means you get out of here and see. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you very much to Alicia and Steve. Um, now, I am delighted to welcome Sue Morris from the Cambridge Museum of Technology. And you just have to bear with us while we switch to the video, which I need to find, which will take me two seconds. Think. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to play it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, over to Sue. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. So from Steve, who's a very experienced hand, you've got jumped straight over to the newbie here. So a little bit about Cambridge Museum of Technology. We're located in the heart of Cambridge and the museum offers a fascinating look into the history of technology and industry. It's housed in a beautiful Victorian pumping station and the museum as a whole is a showcase for a variety of exhibits and displays that highlight the innovations and advances that have shaped our world. It's a chance to discover a wide range of artefacts from steam engines, telephones, radios and of course the most important bit, the print shop. So, I'm, I'm Sue, I'm a volunteer at the uh, Cambridge Museum of Technology and I'm also a trustee of Norwich Print Museum. I've been there since lockdown, so I'm a, a newbie to this. Um, as you can see, our print shop isn't the warmest place in the winter. That is literally my print shop hat. So, as you saw in the video, uh, if you... Not many people know that the Museum of Technology is there, so if you tell them to look for that huge chimney, they'll then know where we're located, because as you, you may or may not know, Cambridge is as flat as a pancake, so anywhere in Cambridge that you look, you can, you can see our chimney. Um, so the print shop is located in a building right outside the massive chimney, um, and that building used to be the laundry for Addenbrooke's Hospital. So the, it was a, the steam was pumped from the steam engines that were used as a sewage pumping station and they were pumped through tubes into what's now the print shop and the hospital sheets were steamed in there to get rid of the germs. And 50 years ago, at the time the council was selling the whole pumping station off, a whole load of engineers joined forces to rescue the building, the steam engines inside it. And at the time, in the building next door, the engineer's house, was a, a guy called Chris Butt. It's a picture of him here. Chris was living in, in the engineer's house and he was training at what's now Anglia Ruskin University. Um, and it was that lucky mix of Chris being in the right place at the right time and printing history moving from letterpress over to litho and Chris, uh, Nick Smith and various others did a really good job of scouring Cambridge, whether it was Cambridge University Press, the art school and the commercial printers to preserve the kit that we've now got in the museum because they, back then 50 years ago, recognised that there's a big chunk of printing history that could very, very easily be lost. So they crammed the kit that we've got now 
into the, this um, tiny little space that we've got. So I'm going to whiz through some slides and give you a rundown of the machines we've got. I'm afraid you're not going to get any dates or anything like that out of me. Um, so as you walk in, we've got a mini Albion press. Behind that, we've got, as you can see, the huge Columbian that dates back to the 1830s. And on your, the left-hand side, we've got a very, very early of the um, very early model. Um, Sorry, nerves are kicking in. A very early Wharfdale printing press. Some examples of some of the things that, we, uh, that we've done in the print shop. And a multigraph type down there on the, the right-hand side. So this is our Wharfdale press. And on, on the Wharfdale press, we've got forms and chases of a book that was printed on the press with indi individual letters and the original blocks and a copy of the book. Um, visitors really love seeing that. That, for me, when visitors come to see us and we show them the Wharfdale Press, like Steve said, they're always asking about newspapers and we say, you know, no, no, there's much more to the printing industry than this. And we show them this set up on the Wharfdale, which is, I think, 12 or 16 pages of this book. And we start explaining that each individual letter in that is an individual piece of type that's all been set and locked up and everything. And you just start seeing the cogs whirring, their drawers dropping, as they start processing how long and how complicated that job would have been to typeset all of that upside down and backwards. We've got a teeny tiny wooden model of um, Gutenberg's press. We've got lead cutting equipment, uh, read, read, write, lead type. Um, we've got some etching blocks that we can't print because we don't have the right presses, but we've got it in our collection. We have a monot monotype, and we've got quite a lot of hot metal um, equipment as well, but I'm afraid I can't tell you anything about that because I don't know. We've got some flongs and some stereotypes, just like St Brides have downstairs. We've got uh, a display that's ever-changing ever of what the volunteers are up to. The whole of the museum is we've got two paid members of staff, a, a board of trustees and a board of volunteers. Everyone in the print shop is a, is a volunteer. Um, so we, we use our stuff for letterpress type and lino cutting. Uh, when the team from Norwich came to visit, this was a highlight of the collection, which is why I'm showing it. There, uh, before we moved over to the point system in the late Victorian period, um, type wasn't measured with the point system that we're all familiar with on our computers. They all had names and uh, going, going all the way down to what is the equivalent of three-point type. When you start showing this tiny, tiny lead type to visitors, again, you know, the looks and the expressions on their faces of just, I can't. I just can't process what it must have been like in a print shop, typesetting on three-point type with kerosene lighting, um, and then being expected to be able to have that typeset with the correct spelling and punctuation and everything else. So for me, this Victorian type is, is a highlight because I'm coming to this as a, a graphic designer. We've got lots of... Victorian type in this cabinet that I'm hoping to come back to St Bride's to find something about because we know nothing about it at all. And in this slide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start talking to you about projects they're up to. So some of you may recognise this character. It's Mark Nodes, who's the chair of the Lettering Arts Trust. Mark and I met two years ago, I think at the Allen Kitching... Uh, letterpress workshop as part of London Craft Week. Not long afterwards, Mark got in touch and said, I've got a project, but I haven't got a printing press. Can we join forces? So I'm going to share a little bit about Mark's project that we're helping him print. So Mark and various typographers from the Lettering Arts Trust, pre-COVID, came up with a whole load of um, uniquely designed alphabet letters, letters of the alphabet that Mark then got 
cut with a laser cut with the help of Will Hill from Anglia and Ruskin University. So uh, Mark wanted these printed, so he came to us. That's another one of our volunteers, Graham. So we, we blocked it all up on the, the proofing press and we're about halfway through the project of printing the big letter that the, um, the type designer created and their name. And Mark's going to collate it into a, into a book. So that's the letter C sitting on top of our Wharfdale press. It's another project that we've got underway our type is a real printer's pie um, and I fell in love with this particular Victorian Gothic font and with the help of the internet and uh, those of you who might know Urban Fox on Instagram, I was able to identify this Victorian font and discovered that we were almost all there in having the whole font set, but there were five characters or five alternative characters missing. So we've got a project on at the moment where we've identified the font, I've redrawn the missing letters in Tinkercad to make 3D renderings. One of the volunteers at the museum has a 3D printer, so we've been able to pass the files over to him. And we're, we started off with original letterpress block dimensions in terms of the main block itself and type high, that's not working in terms of getting a good print result. So we're in the process of tweaking it. So we're bringing Victorian wooden block letter technology right up into the 21st century by recreating these five missing characters with, um, with the help of a 3D printer. And that's us. If you want to track us down on social media, we'd love, to, love it if you came and visited. Um, so whether you're a history buff, a technology enthusiast, or a print addict, you can't go wrong coming to the Museum of Technology. We'd love you to visit. And if you're especially interested in the print shop, we aim to open on the second Sunday of every month and when the museum is in steam but do check on our website or give us a call to double check that we're open before you make the visit. Thank you so much, Sue. I realise I am now planning a lot of road trips in my head. So many fantastic places to visit. Um, just bear with me while I get another video ready to play. Um, to save Paul some fun later. Ooh, it's not gonna play now, so I've stopped that. Uh, thank you for bearing with me as I describe what I'm doing out loud for no good reason. Um, full screen, that's the one I'm pressing. Oh, I need to give you that. So yes, so we now have Paul Nash from the Norwich Museum of Print here to talk us about Norwich Museum of Print. So welcome, Paul. Thank you, Becky, and thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, the Norwich Museum was founded in 1982 by this man, Peter Gerald, who was then chairman of the printing company which bore his family's name. I knew Peter a little bit through the National Printing Heritage Trust, which we both served on in the 1990s and early 2000s. He was clearly a great man, well known and respected in the printing industry, and chairman of the company from 1979, and I think I can do no better in introducing the museum than to show you a short clip of Peter Gerald talking about the John Gerald Printing Museum, as it was then called, around the year 2000. And so I'm now going to try and play you a little video clip. Let's see if I can make this work. This is from a... Uh, a documentary film made by a local filmmaker, Chris Bailey, who you'll see at the beginning of the film. Uh, and in this extract, you can see a little bit of the museum in the background. Now, it's for printers in Suffolk 
somewhere in Woodbridge or Hope or Downing. The farmers as well, when the receipt of the corn was, the farming was led to this business to be in. So they started printing, and there were publishers and booksellers and stationers. And we came to Norwich in 1823 with all those businesses, and they were all the cases where the present girl saw it. I'm very proud of the museum, indeed, yes. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's so easy today to do printing of any sort, color printing on computers, and they, people do not understand all the complexity of how printing developed over well, our time. A small glimpse today into the history behind a number of Norwich and Holland trains. There's no doubt this wonderful museum here keeps alive the heritage of the past in order for us to better understand the impact of future technical development. Now I'm going to try and go back to the slides. That's looking promising. So as Peter says, um, the Gerald printing firm has a long history, having been established in 1810 in Dallinghoo in Suffolk by John Gerald and moved to Norwich in 1823, which is exactly 200 years ago. Um, I've got a copy here of um, a history of the Gerald firm, um, which was published in 2020 to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the, of the firm. Uh, when it was founded in 1770, it wasn't a printing firm, but it became a printer in 1811. And so for much of the history of Gerald, it was a printing firm. And I'm going to leave that here as a gift for the St. Bride Library. Throughout the remainder of the 19th century, the Gerald business flourished and became a successful publishing house, as well as a printer, bookbinder, stationer, and bookseller. It was publisher of one of the most successful books of the century, Anna Sewell's Black Beauty of 1877. And this is a copy that's available to buy on ABE, if any of you have 14,000 pounds to spare. It's a nice copy, and it's also inscribed by the author. The firm had offices in London, and retail outlets in Cromer and Yarmouth, and the main premises in Norfolk. In the 20th century, the focus was again on book manufacture, and under Peter Gerald and his father, also called John Gerald, the printing works became one of the largest and most well-equipped and well-respected in the British Isles. Gerald and Sons were among the first in the UK to adopt four-color lithographic printing and photo composition, and were later pioneers of digital printing and typesetting. The technological changes of the last half of the 20th century were dramatic, and when each technology became redundant, Peter Gerald carefully preserved some of the machinery and tools in his museum, which was thus equipped with letterpress, lithographic, photographic, and photocomposition machinery, and, was good, and also had a good deal of technical testing equipment, an area in which the firm was a pioneer. Peter wanted to record the history of his family business and the skills used in printing and binding, but he also wished to preserve the history of British printing generally, and to honor the industry which fascinated him and which he felt had been, a, had been good to Gerald over the years. He also felt a sense of duty to the communities of Norwich and Norfolk, to the siblinghood of printers, and to the nation to give something back to those who had supported the firm over the years and made it a success. And it was partly for this reason that the museum was open to the public and was always viewed as a working museum, very much like the St. Pride material here, uh, where old and young, and especially young, could see the traditional processes of book production practiced and could learn to print and to bind books and to set type and to use various printmaking techniques themselves. The collection was named the John Gerald Printing Museum after Peter's father. But the name was doubly appropriate as many of the great innovators in the family had been named John, including the founder of the family firm in the 1770s when their trade had nothing to do with printing, and his son, who was the first printer to bear the name. The museum was largely operated by volunteers, many of whom were retired workers from the Gerald printing firm, and it grew between the 1980s and 2010s, chiefly through a series of donations from outside the firm, from other printers and collectors of printing equipment and literature, until it was the second largest collection of historical printing equipment in the country, second in size only to the collections of the National Museum of Science and Industry, which have not been on public display since the 1990s. In 2006, Gerald and Sons ceased printing, driven out of the market, like many British printers, by changes in the industry, and concentrated on the training, retail, and real estate aspects of its business. 
But the museum continued to flourish uh, through the commitment of Peter Gerald, latterly in retirement, and the team of volunteers who had kept it going for so many years. Sadly, Peter was in poor health in the 2010s and was not able to take so active a part in the museum, and he died in 2019. At this time, Gerald announced that their Whitefriars site, which included the museum, would be redeveloped and the museum would need to find a new home. So in 2019, a charitable trust was formed to look after the collections with the new name, the Norwich Printing Museum with the John Gerald Heritage Collection. Every piece of equipment, machinery, type, and every book in the library was packed up and placed in storage. The trust is now seeking a new permanent home for the museum in or near Norwich. Here, uh, meantime, we have a museum in residence uh, at Blickling Hall. Um, here, some 10% of the collection is on display and in use under the care of the Museum Trust and a dedicated team of volunteers with doors open and demonstrations currently available on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. This is my little plug, Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. The Museum in Residence is free to enter and you don't even have to go into Blickling Hall to visit it, although you might want to. So do please pay a visit if you're in Norfolk in the coming months. So much of the history, so much for the history of the museum, but what does it contain? We can make a good start by looking at what's at Blickling, and these next few slides show the uh, equipment being moved into the Blickling uh, Museum in Residence. Um, there's a Columbian Press, probably made by Climmer and Dixon around 1845, which came from the Gerald Works, a treadle plat platen and a proofing press, and just visible, one of the great workhorses of the printing industry, a Heidelberg platen, one of two held by the museum. Here we see a monotype caster and keyboard, and here's some smaller treadle and clamshell presses. And these are all, of course, letterpress machines. And there are more such treasures in storage. The next few slides show um, the interior of the old John Gerald Museum. Um, we have this wonderful Stanhope, which was donated by Cambridge University Press, the successful, sorry, in addition to the Columbian, we have this wonderful Stanhope, um, which was uh, donated by Cambridge University Press. Uh, the Stanhope was, of course, the first successful all-iron press. There are three Albions. You can see one of the Albions next to the Columbian again there. The Columbians tend to be rather the star of the show, but the, uh, the, uh, one of the, the largest of the Albions is beside it. And there are other numerous presses, um, treadle, cylinder, and proofing, including two Arabs, a Silplat, Furnival, Victoria, Pearl, Peerless, Vertical Mealy, Fag, and Stevenson Blake, in addition to numerous small tabletop presses, Adanas, models, and the like, which are ideal for teaching and demonstrations of small scale work. There's also a massive collection of type, both in metal and wood, so, the, so large that it has yet to be sorted and catalogued in its entirety, as well as machinery for casting type. There are monotype and linotype machines, and also a small collection of hand molds. And this is a slightly battered display. It's, uh, it's actually been restored somewhat now. Um, there, is, uh, there are hand molds, punches, and mattresses, which are worthy of further investigation. And some of these are on display at Blickling now. Almost all this equipment is in working order and was used for demonstrations and teachings at the Jar teaching at the Gerald Museum and still is on a smaller scale at Blickling. But all these tools and machines, important and useful as they are, represent the world of letterpress, a technology which survives reasonably well as an historical and artistic process, and which is represented, albeit not so richly, by a number of other museums. The Norwich Museum has, in addition, fine and rare collections of equipment relating to rather more ethereal technologies, intaglio, lithography, photocomposition, and early digital composition. These technologies are generally not represented well or at all in other museums with printing historical holdings. Looking at Intaglio, there's a collection of historical plates and engraving tools and a Starwheel Press of 1858, which is on display at Blickling and used there for demonstrations and printmaking classes. It's seen here surrounded by digital and photographic equipment, including a large process camera and a cliche graph. Lithography is even better served. A single hand-operated stone lithographic press is used and displayed at Blickling, but the museum has four others of different sizes and ages, including this. The Ratcliffe uh, lithographic press made in the 1920s to a late Victorian design and donated by Kerwin Studios. It's believed to be the last surviving example of a Ratcliffe and is enormous. It weighs about six tons and you can get an idea of its size by the picture of the small man standing next to it. And here's another picture of a the Ratcliffe without the small man. 
Um, there's also a significant collection of equipment, tools, plates, stones, and screens for lithographic printing, very often rare or unique survivals. From the era of photography and photocomposition, there are a number of process cameras from the 19th and 20th centuries, and Hadago CR-tronic linotype monophoto and phototypositor display typesetting machines, which I'm afraid I don't have images of. These machines suffer from two problems. Firstly, it's not possible to use them today because the film necessary to create camera-ready copy and the chemicals to process the film are no longer available. And secondly, they tend to be rather ugly machines and so have sometimes been despised and scrapped. And I think we can all agree on the beauty of this, some of the industrial presses, uh, if things like the Columbian, Albion, and even, even this uh, Ratcliffe. Um, whereas the later technology does tend to be less aesthetically pleasing. But this is all the more reason, I think, why they should be treasured, as few examples survive in museums and none in use. And without the protection of printing museums, all physical traces of these technologies could so easily disappear. The same is also true of early digital equipment, which is similarly unusable today, but for different reasons, and is represented at the Norwich Museum by typesetting and scanning machines, including a clichograph, which is a complex device invented in the 1950s for creating relief printing processes, sorry, relief printing surfaces from artwork using photoelectrical scanning. There are four other general groups of holdings that are worth drawing attention to. I've already mentioned the testing equipment, chiefly designed, sometimes in-house by Gerald, to test paper for strength and its qualities to absorb ink, but also for testing metals for plate making and for inks and adhesives. Then there's a large collection of printing surfaces. Um, these are for intaglio, lithographic, relief printing, including a good many woodcut, wood engraved, process and stereotype blocks, as well as examples of camera-ready copy prepared by photocomposition and digital means. The third group is a significant collection of bookbinding equipment, including all the tools and devices necessary to undertake hand binding and repair work, which is carried out on a small scale at Blickling at the moment, but also machinery for binding, including folding, sewing, wire stitching and case making machines, perforators and several guillotines. The final group is books, and I hesitate to say this in such an august library. Uh, the museum holds a significant library of technical and historical literature about printing and presses, and specimens of the work of local printers and of particular graphic and reprographic processes. Thus the collections are both broad and deep, in the sense that they contain a wide range of equipment, tools and specimens from all areas of the historical printing industry of the United Kingdom. Around 30% of the collection came from the Gerald firm, with the remaining 70% being donated by other printing firms, artists, printmakers, amateurs, and individuals who worked in the industry. 90% of the collection is currently in storage, and our aim is to change that and open the Norwich, Museum, Norwich Printing Museum again to the public as a complete and working museum. And that's all, folks. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I think we're going to carry on without a break as we've only got two more speakers to go. Um, and I'm really delighted to be um, introducing Richard Lawrence, who is a very, very, very good friend to St. Bride. He's been a volunteer for years. Um, he's from the Bodleian Bibliographical Press. So if I could just give you that one. Um, and over to Richard. Thank you. Right. <coughs> Um, greetings. Greetings from the Bodleian Library's Bibliographical Press, um, which is quite a mouthful. I'm the printer who works in said press. Um, my illustrious predecessor, you were just listening to, Paul Nash. Um, so, um, there's various things I should make clear. Um, shortly, I'll come to what is in the Bibliographic Press and what we do with it. But first, um, I should explain that rather in the vein of most of the people who've been hearing from this evening. We're not a museum. We are an active printing workshop. Uh, we happen to contain, we happen to have uh, various items which belong in museums or could belong in museums, but we use them. Uh, and we use them for teaching and for experiment. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble reading my own writing, which is not entirely unusual. <laughs> The library, besides what is contained within the bibliographical press, um, bibliographical press is a particular room and set of machinery within the library. Besides that, the library does contain, does hold, quite extensive collections of copper plates, 
uh, smaller collections of wood engravings, wood blocks, and so on. Um, those other materials are all available for study uh, in much the same way as all the book collections within the library, all the manuscript collections are available to scholars and others who have uh, good and not so good reasons for wanting to look at them. So uh, what I'm going to be concentrating on is what we use, what is available within the bibliographic press, as in what is available within the room that is called the bibliographic press. Um, the press itself is housed uh, in the old library, in uh, one of the rooms of the old library. Um, just you can see out the window here behind the stuff hanging on the washing line, uh, the Radcliffe camera. We're very fortunate. Um, we're in what I suppose colloquially might be termed the um, Harry Potter wing of the Bodleian Library. It's been used extensively in photography and so forth. Um, this is a couple of the internal views of the uh, Biblio Press, um, featuring myself, I'm afraid, and um, a stooge who was hired for the occasion. Um, we have quite a list of equipment, which I'll rattle through very quickly. Um, there's something known as a Jura Press, which is a replica wooden press um, built from a drawing of 1511. Um, there's a couple of Albion presses uh, within the room itself. Um, one that came from the Daniel Press, a large machine, and a smaller one, Baskin, uh, Leonard Baskin used. Uh, there's a Columbian, which was part of the Sampson Press. Um, these are various small um, presses of one sort or another and um, art, uh, people who produce um, artist books. Uh, there's a star wheel etching press, um, came from Piano Museum in Kent and previous to that from the last of the music engravers. Um, there's Western Proof Press, um, very like a van der Kook. That belonged to OUP and more latterly Vivian Riddler. Uh, not in the room, there's a wooden replica press, um, which came from Imperial, uh, built by Professor Smith in the 1950s. And there's an original wooden uh, press, um, a common press. Um, more importantly, from our point of view, from the teaching point of view, we have uh, eight sets of 14-point Caslon, with which we can teach people to typeset. Um, so we can have eight, maybe a dozen people, if they're willing to double up on cases. Uh, typesetting simultaneously. You can explore all the complications of um, uh, dividing copy between typesetters and so forth. Also within the room at the moment we have a risograph, um, Japanese stencil duplicator, uh, the uses of which I'll come to in a minute, and we're also temporarily housing some 3D printers while uh, the science library is converted into um, another graduate college. Uh, there's paper, ink, rollers, uh, inking surfaces, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we have quite an extensive collection of wood engravings, which um, some of which we don't use, some of which we do use. Uh, we have uh, wooden type as well as metal type. Um, we have examples of machinery and uh, molds that you would use for hand type casting. We have uh, a limited collection of copper plates, which. Um, came courtesy of Ian Bain, the late Ian Bain. Um, so, what do we actually do with this stuff? Um, here is a couple of views of what goes on in the room. Um, the larger picture is from uh, a regular course we run, a make a book course, rather foolishly um, in previous years. We've tried the experiment of giving people about a week in which to make a book. So they come ill-equipped, and they hopefully, hopefully go away with a book, um, having learnt how to typeset, how to cut lino, how to print, how to bind. Um, last year, we ran it over a number of evenings, which was a much more satisfactory arrangement. Um, we teach courses for literature students. That is actually where the Biblia Crest was originally founded in 1949, with a mixture of people from the library and from the English uh, faculty. Um, we teach literature students both in the English department and German now uh, in the wonders of printing. Um, we indulge in public engagement. We invite members of the public in in one way or another to teach evening classes and to see demonstrations. We also, um, with a couple of the presses that are in a public part of the library, um, give demonstrations on Saturdays, sometimes Sundays and other special occasions. Um, I very occasionally we're called on to um, offer demonstrations to VIPs who need impressing for one reason or another. 
But the main reason for the bibliographic press is the teaching space. And um, we will come to that in a minute. We also, though, um, run experiments. And this is a feature of the bibliographic press, and I would like to suggest one that other museums should look at. Um, here, um, you can just see the arms of my illustrious predecessor, Mr. Nash, um, typesetting. And in the other part of the image, um, the output of the Oxford scribes. We run a little competition. Uh, the scribes were busy scribing, writing Psalm 23, and Paul and I in relay were typesetting it. Um, we wanted to find out how quickly you could write a book against printing it. And after about an hour and a half, rather to my surprise, the scribes and Paul and I, working in relay, not simultaneously, came to about the same point um, in the copy. Um, the interesting thought was that an hour and a half later, Paul and I might have had a couple of hundred copies having printed them, and the scribes would have had two. Um, it's, uh, it, it shows how much quicker typesetting is and the production rate uh, compared to writing. Um, here is another example of, um, well, another couple of examples uh, of uh, what goes on in the Biblio Press. On the left is um, a modern poem, Zong uh, is the poem. It uh, reflects on what happened to a slave ship in 1781, or more likely what happened to the contents of the slave ship, um, many of whom were thrown overboard. Uh, sad to say, and uh, as an exercise for the English literature students studying this, we had them typeset it uh, in order to realize uh, that a typeset poem contains an awful lot of white space, which in printing terms has physical reality. Um, it did make them reflect on um, the sinking of words as the page was created. On the right um, is a very recent English literature MA student who was given the task of creating his own version of Hamlet from the quartos and the first folio. It's the four, 400th anniversary of the first folio this year. And um, he not only created his own edited version, he typeset it and printed it, um, which is a bit of fun. Um, here's another example uh, of some other students. These are German literature students. Um, they were studying resistance of student body in Germany during the Nazi period in the 1940s. Um, the White Rose Group, as they were known, uh, were producing leaflets using a typewriter and stencil duplicator technology. And the students came in and used the typewriter, a Remington, very similar to the one that the White Rose people were using, the original White Rose students and uh, a stencil duplicator in the form of the risograph. We do have a small box suitcase stencil duplicator. At the moment, it doesn't work. But um, it gave them a much clearer idea of how the material they were studying was produced. Um, there's been one or two collaborations um, with the engineering department at Oxford. Um, the engineering department happens to have uh, very, um, a great emphasis on image analysis. And uh, one of the things they did in collaboration with Giles Burgle was create an image analysis software um, for particularly woodblocks. And uh, it was applied to the ballad collection that's held in the library. This is a curious little sidelight on that. Um, the software flagged up that the same hat turned up on different heads. Um, and it is absolutely the same hat. It's not just a similar hat, it's the same hat. Uh, it must have been a separate block, and just for a bit of fun, we had some uh, photo engraved versions of this produced, which are illustrated on the right. You can interchange the hats between different people. Um, it's a curiosity. I mean, it's well known that wood blocks were used in the ballad trade in many different guises. It's perhaps less well known that they were sometimes in bits. Um, here's another example of research that's going on. As I said, there's a very large collection of copper plates in the library's holdings, not within the bibliographic press. And uh, Chiara Betty uh, is a PhD student who's working between the Bodleian Library, where the collections are, and University of London. Um, she's looking into the Rawlinson collection of plates. Um, and as a bit of fun for a donor event, uh, we took 
our star whale etching press, and we took it to the university's uh, Natural History Museum and set it up for the evening for a donor event for the university. And uh, it was interesting, very heartening in a way. Um, we got much bigger crowds actually doing something than the various people who were sitting around computers trying to explain what they were doing. It's, uh, it's a good example that the practical is better than the theoretical. Um, Kiara is also looking at trying to um, determine what the origins of wear are in printing copper plates. Uh, the engineers have very good um, optical scanning technology that allows you to measure very accurately uh, the surface of plates. Um, there's some controversy amongst people who look after plates as to what causes the wear. Um, I have my theories. Um, I think, with luck, we'll be able to show for definite where the wear comes from and therefore uh, how one might safely print from them. Um, another thing we're hoping to get, well, I am hoping at least, I hope Chiara was on board, hoping to get them to do is look at ways of producing images from copper plates without printing them. Um, it ought to be possible. Uh, here's another curious little example of um, something that's an overflow from the library. The library has large collections of nature printed books. Um, I'll let you go away and discover what nature printing is about. But um, we had uh, an intern working on the uh, collection, partly cataloguing it, partly other bits and pieces. But um, also, she managed to produce nature printing intaglio surface. If you take a butterfly, dead, dry, and you wind it through uh, an etching press with a sheet of lead on top of it, you end up with an intaglio plate looking like a butterfly that you can then print from. It's a bit of fun. Um, we've used it also for leaves and other things. Um, one of the other things we do is run a printer in residence uh, a month a year. There's an interruption for the inevitable pandemic. But uh, it started with Russell Marrett who um, at the time was producing his Hungry Dutch typeface with the aid of the type archive. Um, went on to Emily Martin, who was using um, composite blocks to produce uh, cartoon-like characters. Uh, David Arms, who uh, produced another one in his series of um, typographic posters inspired by location. There's then a bit of a hiccup. And Thomas Gravemacher, who very kindly is helping me put new uh, leather straps on the replica press. And uh, next, we have Tia Blessing Game later this year. Um, and just to remind you that we do public engagement, this is the replica common press which sits in the window of a public part of the library. On the left, you can see um, one of the printing volunteers um, working with a form which is the first page of Shakespeare's first folio uh, in type facsimile. <laughs> And on the right, I have no idea what, but um, you get the idea. Um, we aim to use the equipment. We aim to teach with it. Um, so in that respect, we're not really a museum. Um, but teach with it and also experiment with it. Um, a very important function which I would like to promote. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, I think today is just highlighting how much, whilst, you know, I think Richard said, you've got all this amazing historical stuff, but using it, learning from it, experimenting, it's just so exciting. And I'm just, I hope you all are like, probably all in this room anyway, want to go and all print anyway, but I just, I'm really excited to go and explore and experiment more with things. Um, and finally, we have Mary Plunkett from the National Print Museum in Dublin, who's come over to speak with us today. So. I'd like to welcome Mary, thank you. So uh, thanks Becky and um, I'm delighted here to be uh, representing Ireland uh, and the National Print Museum I'm the education officer, and I'm also a designer and printmaker myself, uh, specialising in letterpress. Um, the, National Museum, the National Print Museum was founded by members of the print industry, and in 1996 it officially opened at the Office of Public Works, Garrison Chapel, in Beggar's Bush Barracks, just outside Dublin city centre. 
It is fully accredited under the Heritage Council's Museum Standard Pro Programme for Ireland and is a member of the Association of European Printing Museums. So we are a museum. <laughs> it is, but we are a unique museum, the only one of its kind in Ireland. The collection is made up largely of letterpress printing equipment, which is not behind glass or rope, but is instead an example of a working collection. We approach conservation of this collection by keeping it alive and engaging audiences in hands-on immersive experiences of the craft. The museum is a private company and a registered charity with principal income coming from the Irish government, chiefly the uh, Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaeltacht, Sports and the Media, and as the City of Dublin Education and Training Boards through the provision of a cultural and heritage studies programme. This award-winning programme is a local training initiative. Learners on the programme undertake a QQI Level 5 Common Award in Cultural and Heritage Studies, as well as becoming tour guides at the museum. And we are the only museum in Ireland to offer this course. And this is us, myself, a few staff members and the, the course members uh, on a lovely trip to Newgrange on Monday. There you go. Uh, the museum is one of, a few, one of the few national museums dedicated to our industrial heritage or design and the only one to print. In 2019, the museum successfully applied to have letterpress printing in, uh, listed on the National Inventory of Intangible Cultural Heritage under the, 20, uh, under the 2003 UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. The panel of retired printers and compositors who found the museum continue to play a vital role in preserving the collection and the craft. We are lucky to have this dedicated group of volunteers who make up our chapel. Currently numbering about 15, a good few of them visit almost every week. They maintain the collection, they run the Lino, Ludlow and Monotype, and support a number of events throughout the year. A major challenge is preserving their knowledge and skills and passing these on to future generations. The museum has a collection of over 10,000 objects that cover the whole range of printing craft in Ireland. The collection comprises printing machinery and artifacts, including printing blocks, metal and wood type, ephemera, photographs, books, pamphlets, periodicals, and one banner. Due to space constraints, only 30% of the collection is on display at the museum at any given time. Education is at the core of the museum's public programming. The Education Department of the National Print Museum preserves, protects, and increases awareness of the unique collection and its associated provisions at the museum. It is committed to providing a wide range of socially inclusive opportunities for the lifelong discovery and enjoyment of Ireland's print, printing heritage. These opportunities take the form of guided tours with specialised tours aimed at preschool, primary, secondary, language schools and third level, and demonstration tours, family, adult, children's and corporate workshops, talks, lectures, outreach events all over the country, and online resources. We mark national events each year, such as uh, Engineers Week, Culture Night, Science Week, Heritage Week, Crinion and Nog, with um, demonstration days where the chapel run the presses and share anecdotes with visitors. We're delighted to collaborate with other organisations and individuals to provide educational experiences for all ages. A recent highlight has been the primary school poster making uh, workshops in association with Manaw 100. Uh, Manaw 100 is an online women's initiative by the Irish government to highlight the role of women in the revolutionary period, particularly those who took part in the campaign for independence since the Civil War and also those who served in politics and public life in the period that followed. Next week, we'll have our third workshop in a third series of four, where a group of 30 children will travel to the museum for the day to create posters for the five women who were elected to Doyle Erin in August of 1923, which were uh, Kathleen Brewer, Dr. Kathleen Lynn, uh, Mary McSwiney, uh, Countess de Barkowitz, and Margaret Collins O'Driscoll. Uh, so they will, with their teacher, look to the Manoa 100 website for, in, for information and inspiration ahead of their visit. They will then be briefed by Dr. Sinead McCool, who's advisor to the Commemorations Board, and then they'll work with us and the collection to set and print their posters. So our collection. Within the museum, we have two Albions, a Colombian, a Wharfdale stop cylinder press, two peerless treadle Prattens, a Heidsick, a Titan Glockner, Heidelberg Platten, Van der Cook number four, Shaw pen ruling machine, two Farleys, a few Adanas, and this is a, a full-size model of what we call our Gutenberg Press, which was made for the Tudor's TV show and uh, then donated to the museum. We also have a linotype, a Ludlow, monotype keyboard and caster, about 300 cases of type on site, 
as well as the 3D printer, exposure unit, Sizzix die cutting machine, and the ever popular Lego tiles. We're also lucky enough to have on exhibition an original copy of the 1916 Proclamation of the Irish Republic. Always a highlight of the tour, this document was read from the steps of the GPO by Patrick Pierce on Easter Monday, 24th of April, and began the Easter Rising, a week-long insurrection to proclaim an Irish Republic free of British rule. Although unsuccessful, the events in the years immediately after the Rising led to the Irish War of Independence and to the establishment of the Irish state, which later became the Republic of Ireland. So this, not this, is an original copy of the 2016, oh, sorry, of the 1916 proclamation. And it is believed that roughly 1,000 copies were printed, but only 30 survived today. So one printer and two compositors did the job, Michael Malloy, Liam O'Brien, and Christopher Brady. The printing of the document was an act of treason against the British Crown. So you can imagine how nervous uh, they might have been. It was all typeset and printed in secrecy in Old Liberty Hall which had been recently raided, so that the compositors discovered they hadn't enough type to compose the entire document. Type was borrowed from sympathetic uh, printers around O'Connell Street and smuggled to the hall in a wheelbarrow. They still hadn't enough type, so the document had to be composed and printed in two halves. So you can just see at the bottom of the image there, you can see a gap, and also you can see in our replica here, the gap here of where they had to um, print it in the two halves. By looking carefully at the document, we can see the pressure the men were under and the tricks they had to use to make the most of the type they had. Certain letters, especially the E, were in short supply, so by the third paragraph, they had to move into using a different font. Um, some characters were also treated with sealing wax to turn them into different letters. So for example, the E, I think I have a, the second one I have mentioned there, the, the E of the the there is actually an F with an additional foot. And the last letter in Republic, which I'll show you here, is actually uh, an O, which has been chopped out. Um, and the only actual mistake in the document is an upside down E in the first line of the last paragraph, I think, where is it? Where is it? Yeah, there. There's an upside down E there, and that's the only mistake they actually made. Um, it was printed on a Wharfdale stop cylinder press, which was later destroyed by the British forces. Proclamations were posted around the city on walls and pillars, but most did not survive the fires that destroyed the centre of Dublin during the fighting. Complete originals rapidly became rare in the chaos, and over a month later, in May 1916, the Dublin police force failed to find any further files. So this proclamation bears witness not only to an extraordinary week in Ireland's history, but also to the ingenuity of the printers and how print changed Irish history. Thank you, Peggy. Um, in 2016, to commemorate the printing of this document, three of our own chapel took on the task of, of printing a replica, which is what I just showed you there now. Uh, they made a plate, resisted the urge to correct the mistakes, recovered the rollers on the machine and got it up and running again so that on the 23rd of April 2016, 100 years to the day, they printed a limited edition on a fine art paper. The prints were offered for sale ahead of time, with the offer of coming to the museum on the day to see the printing taking place. All sold out within a few days, and there was a fantastic atmosphere on the day as Freddie Snow, Alf McCormack, and Billy Ryan set the machine running as it happened 100 years previously. An unlimited edition on newsprint is still available. Unfortunately, Billy and Alf are no longer with us. As previously mentioned, a major challenge is preserving the knowledge and skills of our chapel members and passing these on to future generations. <coughs> In 2019, with funding from uh, a government culture program, Creative Ireland, we began the Skills Transfer Program. This is a fantastic opportunity to pass on a little of these skills to the new volunteers. We had over 60 applications for eight places, and the selected volunteers came from backgrounds in graphic design, printmaking, engineering, and tour guiding. The group were introduced to composition, printing on the Peerless, Adana, Vandercook, the use of the Shaw Pen Rule, and with Tom Duffy of Duffy Bookbinders, they were provided an introduction to binding. After the initial training days, they had the chance to practice their skills at various volunteer events, such as our demo days, where the presses and machines are run and explained to the visiting public. After a long absence from the museum due to COVID-19, we're delighted to be welcoming them back in the coming month to return to their studies and continue training. In 2021, to mark the museum's 25th year, we collaborated with the Irish artist Mazer and asked him to respond to the collection. He chose a line from the proclamation as his starting point and set it in wood type. This was married with photopolymer plates of cyan, yellow and magenta in Mazer's signature style. The resulting print was sold in aid of the museum and Mazer's own gallery and studio space, Atelier Now. 
In a more recent project, Joan Sills, the chair of our curatorial committee, suggested and took on the printing of yet another fundraising project for the museum. Uh, entitled Short Stories in Print, it is a collection of unpublished, pro unpublished prose from six of Ireland's leading writers. Anne Enright, Claire Keegan, Christine Dwerhickey, um, Cullum Tobin, Sebastian Barry and Raddy Doyle. It is presented as a limited edition portfolio printed on the Vandercook from magnesium plates and set in a modern face dashiel designed in Ireland by Signal Time Foundry. We have another project with Roddy Doyle just about to go to print. Uh, those eagle eyes of, amongst you might have seen him in the picture of the chapel at the, at the start there. Um, his and Sean Love's organisation Fighting Words works with children and all ages to promote creative writing. For the last year or so, they have been working with our chapel members to collect their stories and anecdotes, and it will soon be published as Strange Types and Odd Sorts. In 2017 to 2019, we took part in an EU-funded project called Creative Makers, along with three other organisations, Explora Children's Museum in Rome, Labora in Tallinn, and Neapolis in Villanova in Geltrú. We visited each other's spaces, created a fab lab for each location, and adapted to each situation, with the intention of using new technologies to introduce letterpress to kids in workshops. The result in the National Print Museum was Print Lab, a colourful corner of our museum, providing workshops for kids in Lego printing, P, P, oh, sorry, P22 blocks, 3D printing and more, always coming back to print and to letterpress, using Adana's and the museum's van der Kook number four. Our temporary exhibitions explore the impact of print and the powerful role it played in shaping our histories. From the monumental to the everyday, printed artifacts uh, capture the spirit of the age in which they are created. And we use the printed output to connect people to this process. Print forms an intrinsic part of our lives and the development, prosperity and rich heritage of Irish printing form an important part of our national story of craft and industry. These exhibitions allow us the opportunity to reach out and connect with new audiences and they've been hugely successful in raising the museum's profile both nationally and internationally. So pictured here and the last is uh, the most recent exhibition, uh, Grand Stuff, Label Art from Ireland by Niall McCormack based on his book of the same name. And previous to that was an exhibition based on our uh, book, um, excuse me, a book of our own publication, um, meant for children, but suitable for all ages, um, Blot's Most Marvelous Historical Guide to Printing Books. Um, so written by Dr. Angela Griffith and illustrated by Jennifer Farley, this follows the story of a young, engaging print apprentice who guides readers, young and old, through the history of print with particular reference to Ireland. So here we are in the Garrison Chapel in Beggar's Bush Barracks, and the biggest cha challenge we have uh, against us is that we are soon going to have to move. And we've been uh, asked to leave our home. So we're looking at this as an opportunity to find a larger premises, a better location, and the opportunity to show more of our collection and expand our education and ex uh, um, exhibition spaces. So whether we are still in the Garrison Chapel or we have found a new home, please come and visit us in Dublin. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Mary. I got um, had a, a fantastic tour of Dublin last year, and it was absolutely magical. And I just oh, had such an amazing afternoon. And just seeing the proclamation in reality was just absolutely mind blowing. Just how they achieved it in those conditions—it was just incredible. Um, thank you so much to all our speakers today: to Alicia, Steve, Sue, Paul, Richard, and Mary. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Um, Thank you all so much for giving your time so generous, generously to travel to be here today. It's been such a fantastic event, and I know I've got so many new places to visit and explore. Um, thank you all so much to our in-person audience, our online audience, and to everyone behind the scenes who made today happen. Um, I'd just like to say thank you, and anyone in person who'd like to carry on the conversation, I think we'll probably be heading to the pub. Um, not the bell, probably the um, Crown and Sugar Loaf for anyone at home. Sorry you can't join us. Um, hopefully you can come in person or, you know, it's just fantastic that you can join us from afar. So thank you all very much. Have a fantastic evening. Good night. <laughs>